In our unit on evolution, we've seen how one species can diverge into two new species. But a trickier question to answer is the origin of life. Where did that very first species come from? If all species come from other species, how do we explain the origin of the first living thing? And if all cells come from other cells, well, where did that first cell come from? That's a question we're going to tackle in this video on the origin of life. Let's start by reviewing what it means to be alive. Living things have several characteristics. They're made of cells, they have a genetic code, they're able to maintain homeostasis, reproduce, metabolize energy, respond to changes in the environment, and, as a species, evolve over time. Living things are also made of certain chemicals, organic monomers and organic polymers, like sugars and starch, amino acids and protein, fatty acids and lipids, and nucleotides and nucleic acids. Remember that organic means that a chemical contains carbon and hydrogen, and this is one major difference between the composition of living things and non-living things. So as we explore the origin of life, we have to keep in mind that somehow we had to have these building blocks. So why did life arise? Well, in a nutshell, the conditions on early Earth made life possible. Several billion years ago, the Earth looked a lot different than it does today. You wouldn't have been, wanted to be around several billion years ago. The raw materials present then included an atmosphere made of water vapor, methane, ammonia, and hydrogen. That's very different from today's atmosphere, which is mostly nitrogen with some oxygen. Note that back then, before life evolved, there was not oxygen in the atmosphere. And that was very helpful for the evolution of life, and we'll find out why. The environment of the Earth back then also had oceans full of chemicals, volcanoes that were very active, and there were lots of storms, which meant lots of lightning, lots of electricity, and therefore lots of energy sources. There was also UV radiation from the sun, and heat from volcanoes and deep sea thermal vents. Another thing to note is that there was no ozone layer back then, and the ozone layer protects the earth and living things from UV rays from the sun. So when did this all happen? Well, the earth itself came to be about 4.5 billion years ago. Some say between 4.5, 4.6 billion years ago. The first living things likely evolved about 3.9 billion years ago. And those organisms looked like prokaryotes. They were anaerobic, meaning they didn't need oxygen to survive. And they were heterotrophic. They consumed chemicals in their environment. A little bit later, perhaps around 3.5 billion years ago, we had anaerobic autotrophs meaning we had some prokaryotes that could do photosynthesis now. This probably came after heterotrophs because photosynthesis is a pretty complex reaction, and so it took time for that to evolve. Atmospheric oxygen appeared somewhere between 2 and 3 billion years ago, and around the same time, we now had aerobic prokaryotes, living things that use oxygen to survive. And this is about the time of the oxygen revolution in which many of these anaerobic organisms went extinct and the aerobic organisms took over. From there, we got single-celled eukaryotes about 2 billion years ago. Multicellular eukaryotes came about 1.5 billion years ago. Less than a billion years ago, animals finally emerged in the water, followed by animals on land, and then, it seems like only yesterday, humans evolved. So how do we know that life began when we say it began? Well, one major piece of evidence is geologic evidence. By radiometrically dating rocks, we've been able to determine that Earth formed 4.6 billion years ago. That's what BYA means. There's also a unique type of fossil known as a stromatolite. This is a fossil that's formed by photosynthetic bacteria. And so we found these stromatolites, these fossils, um, as far back as three and a half billion years ago. So that tells us when photosynthetic bacteria evolved. 
But keep in mind that photosynthesis is complex. And if photosynthesis was around three and a half billion years ago, then heterotrophs were probably around even earlier, maybe 3.9 billion years ago. And this is known as the heterotroph hypothesis, the idea that anaerobic heterotrophs evolved first, followed by anaerobic autotrophs. You might also be wondering, how do we know there was no oxygen billions of years ago? Well, if oxygen is in the environment, it tends to rust rocks containing certain metals. And because rusted rocks are absent prior to 3 billion years ago, that is evidence that oxygen was not around in the environment. All right, so we've seen the conditions of life, or the conditions of Earth a long time ago. How did life actually arise? Well, the current leading hypothesis is a four-stage hypothesis known as abiogenesis. Essentially, the synthesis or genesis of life from non-living things. This is also sometimes called the primordial soup model, based on the idea that billions of years ago, there were oceans and volcanoes and deep sea vents full of all sorts of chemicals bubbling around, and those chemicals became the building blocks of living things. So let's explore this hypothesis. And as we explore the hypothesis, we're going to keep in mind how the conditions of Earth billions of years ago made all this possible. So the first stage in the hypothesis for the origin of life is that those abiotic chemicals found in the atmosphere, like methane and water and, sorry, this is methane, ammonia and hydrogen, they reacted together to form organic monomers such as nucleotides. If you remember, nucleotides are monomers of RNA and DNA. So we use these inorganic building blocks to make organic building blocks. And the atmosphere back then, volcanoes and meteors, could have provided these ingredients. Meanwhile, the energy for these reactions could have come from lightning or UV rays. And finally, these organic monomers accumulated in the primordial soup in oceans, deep sea vents, volcanoes. Stage two starts with those organic monomers, and from the organic monomers, polymers are made. So for example, the monomers of RNA assembled into a long RNA sequence. Again, evidence from the conditions of life Lightning or solar radiation could have provided the energy to make these reactions possible. Meanwhile, water was present in the oceans and in the atmosphere for dehydration synthesis. In order to put these things together, we have to remove water. And there is a lack of oxygen, which was important because when oxygen is around, oftentimes bonds between monomers can't be formed. So the fact that there was no oxygen made the environment highly reactive and highly likely that reactions like this could occur. So stage three is a pretty cool stage. What happens now is that those organic polymers, like carbohydrates and nucleic acids and proteins, become packaged inside cell membranes. Well, they're not quite cell membranes, but they are membranes likely composed of lipids. And we call this package of a membrane with molecules inside a protobiont. Proto meaning before and bio meaning life. So these are like pre-cells. They're not quite cells, but they're getting pretty close. And this membrane was important because now we have homeostasis as a possibility because the membrane is separating the molecules from their environment. Another cool piece of evidence for this is that if you drop lipids in water, because lipids are hydrophobic and they hate water, they will spontaneously form a membrane. So it's not so hard to imagine this happening. And here you can see a picture of a real protobiont, and this is something that you'll hopefully be creating in lab later this week. All right, our last stage, and this is also pretty major, is that self-replicating RNA evolves. Before we had RNA, but it wasn't capable of making more RNA. And in order to be a living thing, you've got to be able to pass down your genetic information to offspring. So when this stage occurred, 
we finally had something that could be considered a cell. And evidence for this is the fact that RNA in some simple bacteria can act as an enzyme. Rather than needing a whole protein to act as an enzyme, the RNA can catalyze reactions on itself. So this lends evidence to the idea that RNA might have evolved to be able to replicate itself. And so now we have protobionts that could theoretically pass down genetic information. And we call this idea the RNA world hypothesis, the idea that RNA evolved before DNA. So this hypothesis might make a lot of sense, probably sounds pretty good, but is there any evidence to support the hypothesis? All of this happened billions of years ago. How do scientists possibly prove it? Well, in 1953, a man named Stanley Miller tested stage one of the hypothesis. And his experiment has become quite famous. He won a Nobel Prize for it. It's pretty awesome. You can see him here many years later recreating his experiment. Well, here's how it worked. He basically had a flask, an upper chamber, which he filled with all sorts of inorganic ingredients. And that was supposed to simulate the atmosphere of the Earth four billion years ago. Then he applied electrical sparks to the atmosphere. And that simulated perhaps lightning, which was quite common four billion years ago. And what he found was that after allowing this reaction to occur and allowing the gases to condense and drip down into this flask, which represented the ocean, he got amino acids. So this was a simulation of early Earth. We had the atmosphere full of electrical storms, and then this condensation mimicked rainfall. And once the rain fell into the ocean, which might have been heated due to lava or deep sea vents, we could indeed get organic monomers from inorganic materials. So this is still cited as evidence today for the hypothesis for the origin of life. Now in class, we'll take a look at some more experiments that provide evidence, and we'll discuss uh, just how well they support these origins for life. Don't forget to take your polls.